one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about is obviously we started talking about mobile TV. So unfortunately, in the past, there have been a lot of attempts at mobile broadcast, uh, internet protocol, mobile broadcast. There was Qualcomm's media flow that yep. didn't pan out very well. There was ATSE mobile handheld. Uh, even AT&T had LTE broadcast. It was a cellular carrier trying to get into broadcast a little bit. That didn't work. So what makes ATSE 3.0 different when we have a whole history of mobile devices not working with broadcast or it, or it not taking off? What makes 3.0 different in this case? I think the big thing is that in, in all of those examples, whether it's uh, media flow from Qualcomm, which was eventually sold off and, and closed down, whether it was um, what happened with ATSC 1.0 or these other examples, these are all sidecar implementations. It was like, well, here's the main service, but we're going to plug in. And, and 1.0 is probably the best example of this. ATSC 1.0, again, designed uh, to be received with an antenna on a 20-foot mast outdoors. Yep. Uh, and yet, okay, now we're going to plug in mobility to that. It worked, uh, not great. I mean, it worked, but it was not only a, a kind of a kludgy development from a standpoint of adding on to an existing standard, but the other piece of television, of course, is the rights. You know, the mobile rights for a lot of content aren't necessarily owned by the local broadcaster. They may be owned by a, by a telephone company. So there's, you know, there are rights issues, there's technology issues, and that's a, a yet another reason why the idea of ATSC3 was, okay, you know, let's leapfrog and move to the best possible system. You mentioned internet protocol. I should have mentioned that myself because ATSC3 is the first and the only so far television system based on the same language as Netflix, which is, let's face it, that's the language that, that people use. And if you're going to transmit video, IP-based or other material, IP-based is, is the way to do it. And so uh, mobility, is, it just becomes another uh, capability. We tend to think of that as, well, I'm going to be able to put a chip in my phone and watch television on my phone. That could happen, potentially. There's another issue in the middle here, which is the phone company. Uh, so they'd have to want, want to have that in a handset like this. Um, but the other thing is, with mobility, you can also do some other things that you couldn't do with 1.0. And this is an area that, while it's not uh, something that you would tune into, Broadcasters are very interested in new data services. And I'll just use a very simple example. I don't know if you've ever rented a car and you get in the car to rent, to drive off, and it says that it needs to borrow your phone's Wi-Fi connection because it needs to do a software update to the car. Uh, this is very common. You know, cars are just like big computers. And so frequently uh, a major rental company will have to take cars out of service plug them in via USB to the internet in order to update the software. Well, that software update could be done over the air. I mean, there's no reason why an over the air transmission couldn't transmit, whether it's to a computer or to a car, uh, a software update. So it's those kinds of things that there's, a, there's actually have been some uh, uh, demonstrations done with Avis Car Rental, very interested in this idea. So they might build in a 3.0 receiver chip into a car, not necessarily for purposes of letting passengers view television, but really as sort of a business benefit uh, to make sure that car stays on the road. Yeah. Uh, something that I'd like to add is there have been pushes to get 3.0 in smartphones and mobile devices in New York State. I'm sure you were aware of that. And then also in India. Now, in India, uh, all the major smartphone manufacturers are against it. Uh, saying that they would not want to include 3.0 in their smartphones if the government of India were to mandate that. Um, also, when there was the ATSC meeting, I think in June, there was a slide presentation of the projected device sales of TVs and set-top boxes. Right. What was missing was mobile devices. So if I can hear from you, what is the, maybe from your Pearl TV hat, if you will, what is the projection for when we'll start to see mobile uh, ATSE 3.0? So let me first address uh, the, the chart you're referring to, which was a data from the Consumer Technology Association, which yes. is 
the association that, that stages the CES show every year in Las Vegas. I don't know if you've ever been to that, but uh, it's a really, you kind of come away from that like, oh my God, I have to own everything that's out there, you know. Uh, <laughs> you would really enjoy it, I think. Yeah. So anyway, uh, a couple of times a year, CTA does its projections about um, based on input from its membership, what are sales going to be for all kinds of uh, devices, you know, whether it's uh, uh, stereo systems or MP3 players or televisions or game players or whatever. So they are forecasting uh, four, four to five million uh, you, you know, so it's a projection. It's not a precise instrument, but they yeah. tend to be somewhat conservative in their estimates. So let's use the number 4 million. They're saying 4 million ish uh, next gen TV sets. Next gen TV is the consumer handle for this ATSC 3.0 technology. Right there, I got confetti. I'm not sure why. Maybe it's because I was using quotation marks. Um, so 4, 4 million-ish uh, next-gen TV sets uh, projected to be sold this year. That works out to about 12,000 being purchased every day, which is kind of a, a, it's a big number, but it's only about 10% of sales. I don't know where Americans put all their TV sets, but we buy 40 million TV sets a year. You know, yes, the mobile device is important. We probably buy a lot more of those, but we still buy a lot of TV sets. Um, somewhere in the neighborhood of a couple hundred thousand set-top receivers, uh, are likely going to be sold uh, in various flavors, yet everywhere from $90 up to $250 and more. Uh, and that's just the very beginning of those for those who wish to upgrade. You know, like I bought a new TV four or five years ago. It's perfectly fine. It doesn't have next-gen TV electronics. So there is a way to upgrade with an HDMI connection, you know, to give you that kind of service. The question of mobile, though, is a it, you really again you've got some somebody else in the middle, and that's AT and T and Verizon and other cell phone companies uh, that frankly enjoy the idea of you spending money for data and charging you for that that privilege. So, but Unicast is so good for uh, right now. All it takes though is going to something like a major sporting event. Um, where that isn't being uh, broadcast uh, in the stadium, which they do from time to time with, uh, I know in Indianapolis, when I go to a Colts game, I can get Wi-Fi service and, and see, you know, the, what's happening with the game uh, through the local, uh, the local stream. But that's not commonplace everywhere. And so in the U.S., which is different than India uh, or other countries, the network operator would have to make the decision, well, in order to get this in a mobile device, you're either going to need an accessory, with, and there are some of those that are available that will plug into a device, or you're going to need to get the, that's going to need to be a feature of the phone. And this actually, um, shortly after you were born, uh, the iPhone came out, 2007. Yeah, yeah. 2007. And I remember that because uh, I was just starting out. Uh, I had left a, a big electronics firm and started my own little company. And I couldn't wait to be unleashed from the corporate stuff, right? And I could finally get an iPhone. And I got an iPhone. And one of the features of the, of the iPhone in 2007, I believe in the very first iPhones, was it had Wi-Fi. Now, you would not normally think that Wi-Fi in a phone would be supremely controversial. And yet, until 2007, until the iPhone, there was no Wi-Fi in phones. Why was that? Because the phone companies were afraid that you'd be making all these free long-distance calls via Wi-Fi, you know, via uh, Skype. IP, yeah. Which, by the way, is exactly what happened. And so... How did the feature of Wi-Fi end up in every cell phone? Well, the consumer demanded it. I mean, uh, the other phone makers saw what happened, and the the other companies that weren't offering the iPhone uh, found out that you know it wasn't that they wanted to skirt the phone charges because now the fact that you use this to make a phone call is is almost an ancillary benefit, right? We use it for so many other things. So I think um, in order to have ATSC3 in a mobile device like that, you're going to have to have AT&T or Verizon or somebody like that go out on a limb and, and make that a requirement of the phone. I don't want to you know, say it's never going to happen because there are pundits who said that Wi-Fi would never be in a phone. Again, it's sort of amazing to think what 
You mean there were phones that didn't have, you know, an internet capability except through the phone network? What are you talking about? But that's that's the way it was up until 2007. So you got to have the you got to have a player involved, uh, a network operator in this case. Yeah. So a few things about that. I think more than anything, when you were saying, you know, there has to be consumer demand. Uh, there has to be broadcasts that people actually want to watch that would make them want to have a TSE 3.0 in a phone. So I know for my generation, mainly the only thing that that people in, in mass numbers watch that are my age is live sports. Other than that, they're going to be watching Netflix on demand. They're, gonna, they're not going to be watching sub channels that have reruns of shows from 30 years ago. Uh, that's not the target for my, and I think, you know, Pearl probably has the numbers of demographics and stuff like that. But in terms of like actually getting you know, ATSE 3.0 on devices other than just TVs and set-top boxes, the programming is an is a super important, crucial part of that.